even today, it'll show a clean pair of heels to one or two of these so-called hot hatches. This was a car that was that came off another planet. This car, for me, is a real wolf in sheep's clothing. They are rust buckets. I still think it is the most wonderful sports car ever built. Jaguar was started in the most unlikely of places. It was Blackpool in Lancashire, as opposed to the Midlands, where most of the motor industry was, uh, was founded. William Lyons lived with the Lyons family in Blackpool, and he, with a, a partner, William Wormsley, started the business of the Swallow Sidecar and Coach Building Company, and they made handmade specialist sidecars for the motorbike industry. The sidecar business was very big in those days because, of course, uh, motorcars were very, very expensive, so most people had motorbikes. And of course, if you had a motorbike and you had a family or girlfriend, you had to have a sidecar to go with it. The normal run-of-the-mill sidecars were quite uh, awkward, square, tin-shaped looking things, nothing very attractive or stylish. What Williams Warnsley found was that with his Zeppelin-styled sidecar, it gave a new stylistic approach to the sidecar and made it an integral part of the bike, and it looked racy and attractive and sporty. And that's what William Lyons realised the potential to produce something rather special here. William Lyons, however, always wanted to produce motor cars, and the most popular small car of the day was the Austin 7. So William Lyons found a tame dealer in Bolton and bought an Austin 7 rolling chassis from them, took it back to Blackpool and built around it his bespoke swallow body. And everybody found this so exciting that Henleys, who were then the largest retail uh, distributor of motor cars in the day, commissioned Lyons to produce initially 25 of these cars a week and later 50 of these cars a week, and that really set the business going. As well as the Austin 7 Swallows, of course, Swallow also bodied other cars, especially for their owners. Uh, things like Mollish Cowleys were bodied, Wolsey Hornets, Swifts, Elvis, and perhaps the most famous outside of the Austin was, of course, the Standard Swallows. With the success of the Austin Swallow in 1928, uh, William Lyons realised that to expand the business further, he had to move everything to the Midlands, because that's where not only could he buy the parts, the important parts to be manufactured, but he got the uh, wealth of skilled labour available to produce motor cars. So they moved to Foles Hill in Coventry in 1928, continued to produce the Swallow sidecars and the Swallow-bodied uh, vehicles, but William Lyons again wanted to produce his own cars, and so in 1931, the SS Mark was born. SS Cars Limited, and they produced cars throughout the 30s. And in 1935, due to the initial, initial success, William Lyons designed a brand new luxury saloon to introduce in September 1935, which for the first time, he not only used the SS car name as a make, but also introduced a model name, and that was Jaguar. And that's the first sight we had of the name Jaguar. Right from the very beginning, Lyons was aware that he was trying to create something that looked sensational, but didn't cost all that much. But in order to market his cars, he wanted to present his 300 pound motor cars as if they were 1,000 pound cars. And one way of doing that was actually to produce sales literature, particularly, that matched Rolls Royce. Post-war, like any other car manufacturer, they had to produce the same models they did pre-war. However, the SS name had a different connotation after the war than it had previously. So they had no choice but to change the name of the company and what better name to change it to than Jaguar, so Jaguar Cars Limited was born in 1945. After the war, Lyons was still very concerned with presenting this upmarket image. So much so that with limited paper allocation, he didn't produce what most people did, a simple slip of paper. He decided to produce an exact replica of his pre-war catalogue at one-tenth size. It was during the war, with its Coventry factory requisitioned by the Ministry of Defence, that the designs took shape for one of Jaguar's all-time classics, the XK120. This legendary car was the work of Jaguar's Bill Lyons, Chief Engineer Bill Haynes, Claude Bailey and Harry Westlake, among others. It was introduced basically as a PR exercise um, to introduce the new three and a half litre engine, which William Lyons had designed and built during the war, really. When it was launched um, at the Motor Show, of course, it had on it an aluminium body built over a, an ash frame. And that was how it was intended to be, just a few models. But of course, with the, the launch that it had and the publicity it got, of course, they actually made the decision at the Motor Show itself to put it into mass production.
they code-named it the 120 uh, because they just stated it would do 120 miles an hour, which all the journalists thought was just fantasy. But later on, of course, it was proved. Um, in actual fact, one did over 132 miles an hour, which, of course, in 1948 was absolutely phenomenal. Even today, it'll show a clean pair of heels to one or two of these so-called hot hatches. A car such as this was destined for great achievements. And in August 1949, we entered three standard works cars in the first post-war production car race at Silverstone. Those who may have doubted the XK120's performance were soon silenced, for it took first and second places in the one-hour event, with an average speed of 82.8 .8 miles per hour. As a lad of 17 just passing my test, I finished it up with a, a little Bond three-wheeler followed by um, a single Le Mans, 1934 vintage, costing about, I think, 50 pounds. Um, and the thought of ever owning an XK Jaguar at over 1,200 pounds was just a dream. Um, and it's taken me 40 years before I've eventually acquired one. And even today, I still think it is the most wonderful sports car ever built. Whilst the XK120 was an instant success at the Motor Show in 1948 for Jaguar, the company as such was still an unknown quantity to many in the world, and it took racing to really put them on the map, and in particular their success at Le Mans was so well publicised that it made Jaguar a force to be reckoned with. Suddenly everybody had awoken to the mark of Jaguar. The C-Type was born out of the successes of the XK120 that competed at Le Mans the previous year, the difference being that this time we had built a car to win. With his team, our chief engineer of that time, Bill Haynes, created a classic racing machine. They retained the famous Jaguar XK engine unit, but modified it to extract 45 more horsepower. And they gave it light rack and pinion steering, a flowing body line, and fitted it with disc brakes. That Le Mans saw Jaguar's drivers Whitehead and Walker take first place. The heart of Jaguar's racing success in the 50s was undoubtedly the 3.4 litre XK engine. That was very, very important from them because this was the single engine they had and it had to power all their subsequent sports cars and saloons. And so every success that Jaguar gained on the racetrack or on the rally helped the ethos and the saleability of the saloon cars. The most successful Jaguar they ever made throughout the whole history of the company up until the introduction of the XT6 was definitely the Mark II saloon, the compact saloon. It came out in 1959 and they produced 92,500 of them between 1959 and 1967. Uh, this car is a Jaguar Mark II and 3.8 1966 with overdrive. The car to drive is super on the road, it's, um, the handling performance is great, it's, um, it's good on motorways, it keeps up with all modern traffic, uh, it surprises a few people at times I think when we go past them. Um, the performance figures are quite good, um, 0 to 60 in 8.5 seconds for the 3.8 and 125 mile an hour top speed. At the time in the 60s you had things like Zephyrs and uh, Austin Cambridges and things like that which the performance figures were about 85, 90 maximum top speed. I mean this was, when it was introduced was quite something. I mean it competed with such cars as Aston Martins, ACs and things like that which were a lot more expensive to buy. Yeah, XK engine that the Mark II uses is um, beautiful engine. Um, you, you can go down to say 20 miles an hour in top gear and still pull away. And 
you can drive a manually as an automatic because the power, there's so much power there and torque. The car, I think, was aimed at um, the young executive type um, that wanted some performance. The positive aspects of the Mark II saloon are that it was both economical, it was small, and actually at the beginning of its life, for the first three years, it was actually the, the fastest production saloon car in the world you could buy. It was de rigueur to own one if you were a racing driver at the time. It was very successful in rallies in its own right, in races, and of course the police used it extensively in the late 50s and early 60s for motorway patrol work because they were so reliable and so fast. The downside, of course, is that because the cars were fast and very manoeuvrable, they also became de rigueur for bank robbers to use. I think modern cars are all the same. You look at modern cars and you can't tell them apart, but if you see a Mark II Jag coming towards you, you recognise it straight away. It's got beautiful lines. Um, and if you drive one, the performance is superb. And the interior, the walnut and the leather, is, is absolutely brilliant. I wouldn't want to own another classic car than the Mark II. Jaguar had tremendous success in the 50s and early 60s. They'd had successful sports cars, large saloons, and of course the Mark II, their best model to date. However, the XK sports car was getting a bit old hat. It was introduced in 1948 and they were still making it in 1960 and 61. They needed something new and exciting for the marketplace. A car that would take the world by storm and would still be remembered to this day as one of the most important sports cars ever made. Ask someone what they remember about the swinging 60s and they'll probably mention the Beatles, Mary Quant and the E-Type. In 1961 at the Geneva Motor Show it was the first time the motoring public had seen anything like this car. It took the world by storm, it's flowing lines, it's sexy looks. I mean the thing was doing 100 miles an hour, I just stood there and it was the car that everybody wanted, instantly everybody wanted one. And of course, at a terrific price, they were £2,098 when they were launched, these cars. And you can compare that to an Aston Martin, a DB4 or a Ferrari, which was two or three times the price. I mean, in terms of looks, performance and what you got, they were terrific value for your money. You got more for your money with one of these than any other car on the market in 1961. The type of person that would buy this car would have been um, somebody who wanted a bit of flash. Show business type people were very typical, high profile, public image, you know, bang up to date car, red hot property. They were also an extension of a, a CADS car, Jaguars were CADS car, you know, bank robbers type image, all this sort of thing. And these were an extension of that, although I don't think many E-types took place in bank robberies because you didn't get much of a safe in the back. William Lyons decided that this car was going to be marketed at a price. As it happens, this was just over £2,000 in 1961, which was tremendous. To do that, he had to cut corners. He didn't give much away. He was in business to make money. That was William Lyons. And one of the areas that suffered in the, in the quality was in the bodywork. Perhaps he should have used a little bit thicker metal in places, designed some rust traps out of it. But no, I'm afraid he got all these included. And Jaguars, as any Jaguar owner will know, has had one that more than five, six years old, will tell you, they are rust buckets. And nothing rusted better than an E-Type. Late 1972, I started full-time education as a mature student. And the inaugural talk we got on the first day uh, by one of the lecturers was about student life and you will, he said you will be able to this and you will be able to that and you'll not do this and you'll be living on grants because we were on a student grant in those days and you don't expect to run any Jaguars out of your grant but you'll have enough to survive on. And I thought well here's a guy, you know, mature student coming to full time education running a Mark II. And I wonder what he'd have thought in 1975, well not only had I got the Mark II I'd also been out and bought this and I bought this when I got my grant check for 1975 and I had to live on virtually fresh air for the next academic year. 
but I bought it, it skinned me to buy it, and I've never regretted it since. Lyons thought it wouldn't sell, and was worried that it was too obviously a racing car, so that the sales material and the marketing material is very much emphasising its comfortable, easy drivability. Press photos and launch photos show glamorous women in cocktail dresses on lawns of country houses. There are no shots of racing tracks, there are no shots of E-types in anything that we could be misconstrued. Because clearly if you wanted people to buy the car to pose at Monte Carlo in, or to drive across California, you didn't want to put them off by thinking you were taking on something that was too obviously a racing car. When you finally get behind the steering wheel of these cars, you feel as though you've been elevated up into society. You will become as successful as people like Simon D and Adam Faith and racing drivers like Graham Hill. You will become part of their little clique. But of course, the fact that there's probably 15 years between the two, <laughs> I paid virtually nothing for it, and they were getting one off the production line that was brand spanking new. We, we tend not to talk about that too much. Despite the fact that Jaguar diversified into many models during the 60s, unfortunately Jaguar were losing headway. They had old cars. This was during a period, of course, when Jaguar were looking to launch a brand new car. They were developing, in effect, a one model policy to bring out a car that would suit all marketplaces for all seasons. And that was the XJ6, which was launched at the Motor Show in 1968. In 1968, when the car was launched, Jaguar was still their own company in their own right. But shortly after that, the, what became British Leyland took them over. And then from literally 1972 and three onwards, the BL in influence and the lack of investment, the general attitude, created decline within the company, which really expressed itself badly in the Series 2 XJs, which had perhaps the worst reputation for build quality. The cars were always breaking down, the paintwork was terrible, even the chrome finish was bad. And this was to lead through a very grey period for Jaguar, which took a long time to get out of. By the very low period of the mid-70s with British Leyland, they were producing not only very shoddy brochures, but brochures that were actually very similar to Sherpa van brochures, Allegro brochures. They were printed alongside them, they were photographed alongside them. In spite of all this, though, the model still kept on selling 100,000 Series 1s, two or three hundred thousand series twos and it's a testament to this model and its styling of the original Sir William Lyons that kept this going right the way through and without this model, this sole model, Jaguar would not be around today in any shape or form. This particular car is a 1987 V12 Jaguar Sovereign. Mechanically it's got a 5.3 litre V12 engine, three speed automatic gearbox and a power lock differential which aids road holding. This car was originally purchased by Lord Rothschild of the merchant banking fame and actually specified the black exterior which, whilst not unique, is certainly unusual in these cars. But then he had the original interior removed and it was all retrimmed in a much higher quality leather called aniline leather to give it a much more a feeling of almost a gentleman's library, gentleman's club sort of feeling inside, which coupled with the dark walnut wood really gives that nice feeling of comfort and relaxation. This car, for me, is a real wolf in sheep's clothing. The feeling when you're driving along is of the effortless power which there is there just to keep you going. There's no real feeling of emotive force at the front of the bonnet. You don't feel the engine vibrating, you don't feel anything coming through when you put your foot down. The car will just surge through. There's no noise from outside the world. You feel insulated from the rest of the world. You're going by and you hear nothing and you feel nothing. And as you do to a degree, I almost feel a bit invincible. The XJ Series Jaguars were Jaguar's most successful car ever, produced from 1968 right through to 1992 in Daimler V12 format. They produced a total of 402,848 of them, a fantastic record for Jaguar. Jaguar to me can be summed up by the original advertising campaign in the 50s, which was Grace, Pace and Space. It embodies all three of these in that it is a graceful car which just smacks a style and taste and class right the way through. There are no flashy lines or spoilers or anything like that. It has the space in that you can sit five 
fully grown adults in the car with luggage and pace of course 280 brake horsepower engine plenty of acceleration to do whatever you want with it even with those five adults and the luggage in there it's that feeling of difficult to describe it's the feeling of being in a Jaguar I'm an undisputed lover of Jaguar cars. I've owned many cars of all different types. I've owned a Rolls Royce, Fords, Vauxhalls, all sorts of things. But I always come back to Jaguars. This is the 49th Jaguar I've owned, and I would still drive and buy a Jaguar tomorrow because they offer me something very special. You are at one with the motor car. There's nothing quite like getting behind the wheel of the Jaguar. Other cars have leather, other cars have woodwork, other cars have nice accelerative engines and look nice on the outside, but Jaguar put the whole package together, all in one. Jaguar today may be owned by the Ford Motor Company, but even the experts and the, the, the big chiefs at Ford realised that the, there was one man behind Jaguar cars, and that was William Lyons. William Lyons had an eye a very specialist eye for what was right. He used to hand style the cars himself. And you could say that every first off model was always the greatest success. Whether you talk about a Series 1 E-Type, whether you talk about the first XJ6, or the first Mark 7 Jaguar, or XK120. The models had to progress to suit the marketplace that was available at that time. But the first of the line was always the purest. And the purest, of course, was what Lions designed first off. Even today, when they're designing the new cars, they look back at the cars they produced in the 50s and the 60s, and they actually take them into the styling room and compare them and look how they can change the cars today to make them look more like a Jaguar. Jaguar's latest model, the X300, does hark back to those very special styling days of Jaguar.